So what is Digital Bridges? Um, it's one of the three strategic initiatives that have been launched by the center in the past two years. If you were at the Triangle session this morning, you know uh, it was our first strategic initiative launched in 2006, cultivating projects located at the intersection of academic research, classroom learning, and clinical implementation, field implementation. The Global Learning Initiative uh, is the newest one. It's launching this year, um, and it, it's defining new models of distributed learning. I encourage you to attend the session on it later this afternoon, I believe at 2 o'clock. So Digital Bridges is the middle child initiative. Uh, Columbia classes uh, with resources and capacities suddenly available to us through advances in technology. As with all the strategic initiatives, you can read more about Digital Bridges by going to our homepage and clicking on the strategic initiatives link. Take you to the Digital Bridges homepage. So there's our representation of a digital bridge. <laughs> Uh, the specific bridge and digital bridges runs between the classroom and the library. Uh, now these two entities um, are representational. By classroom, I mean a variety of web-based environments that we build at the center and the learning activities, sometimes in the classroom, sometimes at home, that engage them. And by library, uh, I'm referring to not only Columbia University's amazingly rich library system, but also the digital collections that are increasingly available to us in almost staggering profusion. Uh, collections assembled not only by universities and their vendors, but also by museums and documentary producers and any other kind of entity. So there's a lot of bridging to be done. Uh, now, I'm sure that we all agree that delivering curated, high-quality content into learning environments is a good and proper thing to do. Otherwise, we know what happens. If good source material isn't made available to students at point of need, they are too likely to jump out into the felicities and duplicities of the open web, cultivating in the process no certain sense of authority or provenance. Our librarians, of course, work tirelessly to teach students how to find the rich information available to them at an institution like Columbia. But navigating out of an authoring environment and through a variety of gates and interfaces is a constant challenge to students wanting to incorporate quality data and resources into their work. The Google keyword search is ever a siren call. Meanwhile, of course, the web is becoming increasingly immersive and interactive. Meanwhile, too, our libraries are seriously investing in electronic resources that could and should be integrated into the increasingly sophisticated learning environments made possible by web services. Last year, for the first time, Columbia's library spent more on electronic resources than on books. Over 50%. All right, back to our bridge. These conditions, of course, have been developing for some time. We need no initiative started last year to come to tell us that. Um, and the center has long collaborated with the libraries here to port high quality materials into study environments. The online music reserves, a very early and enduring project of CCNMTLs, brings instructor selected tracks from our music and arts library into one easily browsable and sortable place for music home students. And this is work that continues all the time. More recently, we've worked with the libraries and CUIT to offer research guides to every instructor who uses courseworks. These are librarian authored lists of pertinent databases, books, and services customized for specific departments, schools, and even individual classes. So these are a couple of quick examples of getting resources from the library into study environments. Um, we have long worked with the library to do just that. It's a foundational element of digital bridges. But access, uh, as important as it is, is just one direction on the bridge. The Digital Bridges Initiative is also interested in the other direction, capturing what happens as students use materials they've accessed from digital collections as they learn and 
in select cases, feeding back evidence of this use back into the collections. Now, why would we want to do that? When thinking about that question, I'm always reminded of my very first job at Columbia University, a uh, work-study job when I was working in the library in college. Uh, this was an era, I'm sorry to say, long, long before the internet was out of the hands of DARPA and the odd, odd scientist. Um, a rogue graduate student uh, had finally graduated, or finally given up, I'm not sure which, and brought back to the library hundreds and hundreds of books defaced with all kinds of scribbled annotations, and my job was to erase these annotations. <laughs> now, we've all seen uh, books in the libraries that are uh, so scribbled, um, and usually it annoys us, sometimes it intrigues us. Um, couldn't help but throw that in. <laughs> Uh, it seems to be human nature, though, to pin thoughts directly to material that gives rise to them, and an act that could sometimes be posited even as communication. There. Uh, this is another uh, example that I found, and you probably can't read these scribblings, and it, it's some argument here. Um, and uh, one annotator has written wrong, never read the literature, perceptions of objects, blah, blah, I can't read that. And somebody else down below said, it's not wrong at all. And then a third person on the right says, hey, don't write in library books, kids. <laughs> um, however keen you are to prosthetize. <laughs> so when is it possible and desirable to feed student work into a collection? We are now seeing faculty come into us with visions of projects that do not evaporate at the end of a semester but grow into sites of thematic research connected to primary resources, places where students can discover each other's work and contribute to a growing knowledge base. To sketch the dynamics of our two-way bridge as we look at a few of our projects, I'll be emphasizing three themes. Students as scholars. <clears throat> when students are able to work with primary sources and real data, they feel that their work matters. Participation in a social practice of research based on high quality materials raises the stakes in the classroom. Activating collections. Active inquiry means that students are doing things with the objects that they are studying. They are making a difference with their activities. These activities are imprinting themselves onto the materials in the course of analysis. Digital collections are then illuminated by this use and in this way brought to life. And finally, beyond the university. Good materials supporting learning for a given class may well come from heterogeneous sources, sources inside and outside the university. The best of what students do with these materials may be productively shared not only with each other but outside the university gates. So I'm going to move those themes out of the way and show you some quick examples of CCNMTL work that resonates with them. Um, I think that you'll uh, find that they are interconnected, and as a matter of fact, I realized just this morning that they could read as a sentence. So first, students as scholars. As we draw on research-grade material held in our libraries and repositories, we are developing innovative ways for students to not only access, access them, but also analyze them. For example, in the Hovel at Columbia site, built in partnership with CU Arts, as well as faculty across several schools and departments, digitized archival material held in the deep re recesses of the rare books and manuscript library was brought into galleries where students could analyze and collect them into their own sub-collections. And in these sub-collections, they could also bring in video material held by the libraries and shot at events and performances that accompanied Václav Havel's visit and even contributed to us by news organizations. And they collected all this in personalized notebooks, so they were able to make and publish to the world sub-selections of a wealth of Havel-related material. In the Sacred Gotham Project, developed with Courtney Bender in the Religion Department, we touched on this this morning in the mapping session, 
We work with Columbia's electronic data service to reformat raw census, land use, and transportation data, put it in visual layers, and make it available to students publishing reports on religious groups in New York City. Here you see a student comparing Mormon temple locations to the population profiles of surrounding communities. In our new Black Rock Forest sampling simulation, which is being designed in partnership with Hillary Callahan in Biological Sciences, students are getting access to real tree growth data gathered and managed at Black Rock Forest and uh, also in collaboration with Lamont Doherty. That's what it looks like. We're drawing the data out of pl plain spreadsheets and into an environment where students can use it to practice the fine art of tree sampling, which I have learned is a lot more complicated than you might think. Maybe we should change our theme for the moment from student as scholars to students as scientists. So we've already been bleeding over into our next theme, activating collections. Learning in a digital environment can involve constructivist activities, making, remixing, editing, and annotating, and sometimes these activities can shape a collection over time. In history professor Manny Marable's Harlem Heritage Project, which we launched with him last year, we draw in Harlem-specific materials from many areas of the library, the oral history office, special collections, Butler Media, as well as repurposed material from past CCNMTL projects. Students across semesters tag these items, and as they study and incorporate them, they tag them and they put them into class presentations. Maribel has defined priority tags for this class, primary themes he wants to emphasize, and students decide which of these themes best applies to the materials in the collection. In Engaging Digital Tibet, which we're building right now in partnership with East Asian Language and Culture's Gray Tuttle and launching very soon, rich images of Tibetan material objects from the Rubin Museum and from Star East Asian Library and from Professor Tuttle's own collection will be browsable, and students will be able to make and share annotations on the objects as part of what Tuttle is calling object biographies. Of course, active manipulation of items drawn out of a collection is in the core DNA of the center. VITAL, Video Interactions for Teaching and Learning, launched in, back in 2003 with Herb Ginsberg at Teachers College and now used extensively across the university and the school. Social work, for example, Teachers College, Barnard and Uptown at the Medical Center, also at Hunter College, is an environment in where students browse a small library of course-specific videos, make and store their individual set of clips, and integrate these clips into multimedia essays. These resources and the activities that engage with them are often necessarily confined to a participating class or to Columbia University. But we are sometimes able to open up the gates to mutual benefit. For example, CC and MTL is collaborating with WGBH in Boston on a project that would digitize all the interviews and stock footage collected for the landmark documentary that they made in 1982 called Vietnam, a Television War. <coughs> Here we have a, a, a conceptualization that we are doing, ways of integrating some of this material with Charles Armstrong in the history department, uh, June Cross in journalism, and several faculty members of Teachers College, and you can see that various items, or you probably can't see because it's quite small, but video clipping, public tags, export to desktop, digital notebooks, multimedia essay, um, a variety of activities and tools to accompany this video library. The engagements that we build and implement in classes here at Columbia, and perhaps even the tools that power them, will then be shared with other universities and with WGBH as it searches for ways to extend the educational life of their documentaries through outlets like Open Vault. I already mentioned Gray Tuttle's Engaging Digital Tibet project. It's stocked with photos provided by museums for this project. Currently, the Rubin Museum 
and the much smaller but very endearing Jacques Marche Museum in Staten Island. Um, and there will probably be more museum partners as the uh, project continues. In consultation with Star East Asian libraries, these images that they're giving us are being cataloged according to lines defined by Professor Tuttle so that students can find objects, annotate them, and create object biographies. Professor Tuttle will select the strongest object biographies for promotion to a publicly accessible area of the site. In this way, museums will see that the materials that they are contributing are actively being used by classes at Columbia studying Tibet. Sudhir Venkatesh's Southside Chicago Documentation Project has a similar dynamic. It is being built with a collection donated for the project in consultation with Columbia librarians who are helping us to digitize and organize it. And eventually the strongest work, student work attached to it will be published back out to the public. So we've been on a little whirlwind uh, tour of some of our projects. It'll take a few moments to step through a couple of them starting with Southside Chicago with John's help. So, professor, uh, sociology professor Sudhir Venkatesh has been given um, a treasure trove of uh, community-based uh, uh, newspaper called the South Street Journal. Um, this archive he has given to us to digitize, and what you, this is what you see here. Currently, the archive holds issues of the South Street Journal published from 1993 through 2008, and it's the kind of publication that is very spotty. Um, if uh, the publisher uh, gets elected to office, they will cease publication, that kind of thing. We digitized these papers and uh, ran optical character recognition on them with the great help of Bob Scott at Columbia University's electronic text service. These digitized issues of the South Street Journal can be easily browsed. I can even uh, run my mouse over individual pages and glimpse them before opening one up. When we do open up an individual page, we can zoom around in on it. And probably the most innovative part of this is that we can generate a link to a specific view of this page. And this is a tool that I don't see even in the ProQuests in the, in the larger databases. grab a very specific chunk and send it to somebody else. Note that this is image browsing and it's not limited to text. For example, I can zoom in on an ad or an image very easily as well and share that, not just an article. Um, notice the rip here too, the fragility of this uh, material. Yeah. Note too that I always have the ability to download a complete issue to my desktop. Um, let's say I was a student and I was doing a report on Bobby Rush, the Illinois congressman who held back an insurgent young Barack Obama in 2000. Um, so I can do a search for Bobby Rush in the PDF and find exactly all the places that he has mentioned in this community newspaper, not only the articles but also the ads. I can also search across the archive for references to Bobby Rush using an advanced search tab, and the librarians uh, in the room won't think this is a big deal, but for us it was at the center, we have never built a project with advanced search. Um, and this is part of bringing true scholarship into our study environments. So 147 results over the, all those years. If I wanted to limit my results to stories that talked about Bobby Rush's Black Panther associations, certainly do that too.
So, Southside Chicago is still in development. Professor Venkatesh is interested in adding more community newspapers to this archive, and we are planning with him a student analysis layer that will sit within the archive, activating it with annotations, interconnections, and links out to relevant resources. To get a sense of how that student analysis layer should work, we are right now monitoring his students' use of a Wikispaces site that is acting as kind of a lab a laboratory for archive analysis in his ethnography of African-American urban communities class. Students in this class work in groups. So let's look at a report by a group studying the way economic issues are discussed in the Southside Journal, in particular in the Southside community in general. We can see um, that students are linking directly to articles in the archive. We can also see that not only are they linking to the articles, they're linking to those ads. We've conducted a preliminary quantitative analysis of the kind of links that Venkatesh's students built into these reports. In, round one, in one round of reports written just by 12 students, four groups of three students each, we counted 425 links to the Southside Journal. Uh, archive, and almost 100 to the Columbia University Library databases as well, and another 50 or so to external websites like blogs, MySpace. We'll continue to work with Venkatesh to make this project a tool to teach students how to research issues on urban poor communities in which, as he says, uh, quote, source data is complex and multidimensional. Already he's lauding the project as, quote, effectively bringing undergraduates closer to the lives of those less fortunate in the city and opening up new research doors. And by the way, the project is giving the South Street Journal an online presence, something it never had before. It is now accessible to anybody on the web. Its publisher, Ron Carter, is make, visiting Venkatesh's class later this fall and has expressed great enthusiasm for making it available as a platform for student analysis, the strongest of which could be published along with the public archive. So let's turn to a quite different project that nevertheless uh, carries some of these same traits, uh, the elements of a Digital Bridges project. Uh, it connects students with source materials, it activates a collection in innovative ways, and it opens up dynamic resources and activities here at Columbia to audiences beyond. Mapping the African American Past, um, is another web, the CCNMTL website that is open to the public, and I'm very glad that we're building more and more of these open sites. It offers on its front end information geared to K-12 learning about sites of particular importance in the long history of African Americans in New York City, ranging from the 17th century up until very recently. There are several ways to explore this site, and I invite you to do so. One is to open up the map navigator, here you see a current map of New York City with pins demarcating every historic site covered in a map. You can also browse locations by scrolling through historic maps, maps we gathered from uh, Columbia's archival holdings as well as from the New York Public Library and the David Rumsey Map Collection. As you can see, these historic maps themselves are beautiful and well worth exploring as representations of New York City. The shareable link function allows users to gather and share links to specific views of any map similar to what we saw on the South Street, Southside Journal. Notice that uh, places are associated with these maps roughly corresponding to the slice of time that they cover. So if we look at the African Burial Ground site write-up, here's a full place write-up. It consists of a description of the site written by Creative Curriculum Initiatives, a K-12 textbook producer, so it's professionally written. A featured video, in this case, we, CCNMTL, interviewed the architect of the African Burial Ground Memorial Site down in the Financial District. A representation of the site as it originally existed, Often in, on map, these are archival photos. In this case, of course, we have no access to that. Uh, we have a drawing commissioned by CCI instead of an imagination of this site. 
um, a patch of its associated map where the site was located. And we also have a recent photo of the site location, allowing students to compare with the city they know, with the city they're studying, and its location on a current map of the city, as well as a range of supplemental materials. So we also have additional videos from figures in the community. We have interviews that we conducted with Columbia University faculty here, uh, Kelly Jones in the Art History Department, and Ken Jackson. Many sites also have an associated lesson. These were written by teachers, college students, under the supervision of social studies leaders Margaret Krakow and Bill Gaudelli. These lessons are geared to New York State social studies standards and are a resource for teachers covering events and topics uh, in 8th and 11th grades. There's also an adapted 4th grade version of each lesson. So if we go to another location right up. This is the entry for the Duke Ellington Memorial Site. <clears throat> it's another one of the 58, I believe, locations in county. It too has video. This featured video is an interview with Columbia University professor Bob O'Mealy. Additional images, including selections from CU's uh, Rare Books and Manuscripts Library and aso an associated historic map. When John clicks on that map, you'll see that uh, we go back into the map navigator, zoomed right into the section of the city most associated with Duke Ellington. And back in the map navigator, we are invited to explore other places whose history is roughly contemporaneous in the site. So MAP is a rich and growing collection of newly created, repurposed, and archival material. It's accessible through exploration of maps and places. Um, it also offers a growing multimedia library, as well as a growing collection of lessons. So it's a nice resource for the public and for K-12 students and teachers, but what about Columbia University students? Well, here we're working on the back end. We've op opened up two contribution channels so that this resource can actually shape learning here. Let's go to the Ebbets Field Place right up. This place looks like others in the map. In map, this place right up looks like the others, but its description is not written by professional textbook writers. Instead, it's authored by a student enrolled in Professor Kelly Jones's History of African American Art in the 20th and 21st Century. Professor Jones modeled an assignment on MAP, and an incentive for doing well was that the strongest reports would be published onto the public site. Several place write-ups on MAP are now student-authored, and more will be added when Jones runs the class again next semester. Here you see the rough draft of that same place write up in the Wikispaces site that Jones used in her class. We were only able to use rights cleared images on the public site. We gave Jones's students some instruction on this and that helped them become aware of rights as a pertinent issue and gave an extra imperative to correct sourcing. So Jones was selective. Uh, singling out only six of these reports for the public site. It put her into the role of an editor, kind of a new role for an instructor sometimes. Another contribution to channel to MAP are the lesson plans from Teachers College. As we saw, there are already many lessons live on the site now, but we're building a new lesson builder application uh, that will help students at Teachers College enrolled in advanced social studies courses to make lessons that are increasingly integrated into the multimedia that is on the site. The lesson builder, we're calling it, uh, will allow tomorrow's, teacher to tomorrow's teachers to practice making social studies lessons for a variety of situations that they will encounter out in the field. Teachers College students will be making tiered versions of these lessons thinking about implementing lessons in technology-rich as well as technology-challenged environments 
and thinking in general about the efficacy of multimedia for various learning activities. As they create lessons, teachers, college students will have at their disposal all the assets in MAP. The strongest lessons will be identified by our faculty partners at Teachers College and versions of these will be published to the public map site so that working teachers can use them, adding to lessons already available on the site. So though MAP is quite a different project from Southside Chicago, it similarly allows Columbia students ways to ground their study of a subject in an ongoing digital collection, ways to contribute to the collection and shape it and ways to make the best of their work accessible beyond the university. And now it's my pleasure to turn over the microphone to Patricia Renfro, Deputy University Librarian and also Overseer of CCNTL, as well as the other digital uh, centers at the library, the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship, the Library Information Technology Office, the Copyright Advisory Office, Digital Libraries Program, and the Preservation Group. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Thank you, Mark, and good morning. I wanted to um, focus in this last section of the presentation on ways that Digital Bridges draws on the traditional strengths of the research library and influences planning for collections and services. So I'm going to talk briefly about building collections, about long-term preservation and reuse of material, a little bit about staff expertise, and about supporting learning. Mark noted that this year we've turned the corner on the percentage of our collection development money that goes to print versus digital, and we're now spending just a little more on digital collections. We're also building the digital collections by digitizing unique and special materials in Columbia's collections. And uh, in doing so, um, we are looking at, uh, you know, what are the factors that cause us to select something for digitization? Typically, it's a fairly resource-intensive process to digitize material. And it, one of the factors that's influencing us increasingly is what the potential use might be of something. What, what faculty interest there is, is there a significant teaching component to putting some material up? This is an image of the Tibet Mirror. It's a, a very important Tibetan newspaper published in India in the first half of the 20th century. We come by this collection at Columbia um, by an odd and interesting route. One of our graduate students was in India visiting with the son of the publisher of this newspaper and uh, was given a chance to look at the building that the newspaper had been published in that's now derelict. And in the attic, he came across old copies of the newspaper, some of which were being uh, used by rats to build nests. And he asked if he could uh, retrieve this and bring it to safe housing at Columbia. And the um, owner of the material said yes, indeed. So apparently he put as much as he could into his rucksack and came back with it and then sent a fellow graduate student a couple of years later to pick up more. As a consequence, we have one of the very few sets of, of copies of this newspaper. There are a few more issues and we don't have a complete set few more issues at the Library of Congress and at Yale. We knew we needed to preserve it because it's in pretty fragile condition. And our typical approach might have been to microfilm this because that's still the best long-term preservation strategy and it's the most cost-effective. But we knew from talking with uh, the faculty that there was very significant interest in teaching from this material, even for language teaching from it. And so we've, we've made a commitment to digitize it, and it will go up onto the open web. The owner of the copyright, the publisher's son, has given us permission to do that and is very excited about making it available. So you'll see that we've, we've placed the arrow here from library to classroom because this is a, a situation where, in fact, we're building a collection that will potentially have very significant impact in the classroom. The uh, South Street Sh Chicago Journal that Mark talked about is a, a sort of reverse process where the digitization of this happened because of significant faculty interest in teaching initially. Uh, we are hopefully going to pursue some conversations with the owner of the copyright to see whether he, he she would be interested in letting us put this up on the open web 
and making it a, a part of our digital collection. So the uh, traffic in collection building seems to us can go both ways. And then a third um, area of collection building that Mark touched on and that I think we are just beginning to investigate now, uh, student content into collections. Of course, we've always collected dissertations, which are the sort of highest level of student scholarship. But we haven't traditionally done very much with undergraduate work. And uh, I think now as we see students doing really interesting original research in these projects, there's going to be a lot of interest in seeing whether we can really uh, incorporate long term their work into the collections. And I think more work to do in that area on rights and permissions. And we fortunately have uh, a copyright advisory office here and our colleague Ken Cruz is talking in the other room about some of his work. But I think opportunities to investigate some of the issues about working with undergraduates and graduate students to publish their work. Libraries, of course, traditionally have collected material and also preserved it. And uh, we've learned to pretty well uh, deal with preservation of print materials. Uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that we have uh, a, an amazing high density storage facility near Princeton University, which now has over 7 million volumes from Columbia, the New York Public Library, and Princeton, uh, and now um, has over 3 million of Columbia's books there. This is allowing us to continue to build collections without taking up more space on an already space-starved campus. We realize that we need to do something very comparable for digital storage, and so we're um, just at the beginnings of building a long-term digital archive uh, which will allow us to uh, store our digital content in very safe and secure ways. So our environment now will include um, the opportunity to have two copies of data here on the Columbia campus and two copies in upstate New York at the NYSENET facility and we're actually proud to be leading the university in this direction of storing its data outside Manhattan which seems like a fairly good idea given the world we live in. Um, we'll have 70 terabyte, terabytes of storage in this initial phase and we recognize that this is just the beginning and we need to go on uh, building that. We've, we've already got 22 terabytes of material in various much less secure storage environments to load into this facility day one. So we will be storing uh, over time a lot of the material that um, the Center for New Media develops. I think it's possibly true to say, although people in the room who work for the Center could correct me, that uh, when, when the Center for New Media started, it wasn't as concerned about retaining and keeping material that it developed. But as it's developed this rich set of resources of video and image and text, it begins to see the value of being able to reuse this material. And so we'll be, um, we'll be implementing with the storage environment, the Fedora digital asset software, which many large research libraries are now using to manage the storage of data, to, uh, to put in the sort of metadata into this environment that will allow us to reuse digital objects. So you can imagine some of the things that Mark's just shown with multiple objects in them, a piece of video, many pieces of text, many images being stored in separate ways so that you can reuse pieces of that and break apart effectively what's been created here in order to build new resources over time. I wanted to just touch briefly on staff expertise. One of the uh, great benefits that the Center for New Media has in being in our information services organization is that it can call on the expertise uh, of uh, librarians and library staff, uh, a group of people who have deep subject expertise and deep knowledge of the collections here at Columbia. So uh, we're showing here uh, another image from the Harvard Columbia site uh, that came into the collection from uh, Mark's work with the uh, curator of the Buck Native collection, an extraordinary collection of uh, materials uh, from the Russian emigre community, but also very rich in Eastern European materials. 
and Tanya was able to pull a lot of significant material about Halden's life and work that went into this environment. Uh, equally, you've seen some examples of the spatial data mapping that our GIS librarians have been able to provide in working with the center. Uh, this is an image from some work that's being developed right now in the journalism uh, area for uh, a class on um, reporting and writing. And uh, data being presented here uh, from the census on poverty levels in the city. And then uh, lastly, I wanted to just touch on uh, supporting learning. One of the key uh, goals of Digital Bridges is to encourage hands-on use of digitized materials. And uh, in order to encourage that in another way, um, one of the things the libraries is putting a lot of resource into now is into developing three digital centers for students to work in. One in social sciences, one in humanities, and one in the sciences. These centers are going to be equipped with very high-end uh, hardware, um, high-end software, and they'll be staffed by librarians and IT staff to help students in the use of resources. The first of these is going to open in Lehman Library, and these are some shots of Lehman Library and of parts of Lehman. Uh, it'll, it'll be opening, we hope, in the next two or three weeks. I couldn't show a picture of this space because at the moment it doesn't have its equipment and it doesn't look very digital. But within two or three weeks we will have um, a, about 35 workstations, many of them with two screens, two monitors. Um, part of this has been contributed by Dell, which we're thrilled about. And um, we'll be able to really focus there on spatial data work and electronic data work. And the last slide I have is um, a rather beautiful slide for a workshop that the uh, Star East Asian Library is going to be hosting in the new year on Tibetan studies and the social sciences. Uh, this workshop is going to provide students with models for Himalaya-related social science research projects and hands-on experience in using tools and materials to further their own research. And I wanted to show this uh, because I think it's another really good example of the bridges that are being built to bring curated materials into the classroom. So the work of the Center for New Media and the work of the libraries has tremendous synergy. Thank you very much. I don't have a clock, but I think we have time for questions. Um, I'm interested in understanding, uh, these, these are fantastic examples of, of really interesting ways to be using technology in the classroom. I'm interested to understand where the ideas are mostly coming from. Are these things where faculty are coming to you saying, we really want to teach something using these collections, can you build a tool for that? Or are you going to them and say, do you realize you could be doing these sorts of things? What would you need? What, what can we make for you? How can we support you? What's the relationship? Where are the ideas coming from? Uh, yes. <laughs> Canonically, uh, we start with faculty. Um, faculty come in and uh, we sit down with them and we, we find out what they're teaching, how they're teaching, how new, new technology might improve. Um, or foster activities that they want to bring into their classrooms. Um, but as we work with librarians, we always find that um, our outreach efforts, our communication with faculty and theirs can often be very synergistic. Um, they often know about faculty research interests and, and teaching interests that we don't know about. Um, and so often we find our way to projects through the librarians. Um, if not even at the beginning of a project, during a project, we, we discover resources, we bring those resources to the attention of our partners, our faculty partners, they modify their ideas about what they want to bring into their classroom. So it's very synergistic and as Patricia mentioned, we're, we're very lucky to be um, working within uh, the same system. Um, I've been at other schools where educational technology and the libraries were entirely two different organizations even if they were located side by side, they really had no idea of what each other could offer. Um, so, 
uh, you know, projects come to us, sometimes they come up to us because we have an opportunity, um, but mostly they come to us through the vision of our faculty. Um, I have two questions, and the first one is a very naive question, so forgive me for asking it, but is there evidence that these type of um, technologies in the classroom lead to better learning? And let me just tell you the motivation behind my question. There was a significant amount of controversy on the um, more, um, health sciences campus related to digitizing collections that we had. Um, and so I'm curious uh, about what your opinions are about the impact of having a book in front of you that you could write in and scribble in as opposed to having something digitized. And then my second question is much less controversial. I wanted to ask you why was Chase listed as on the bottom of one of your, uh, I think it was the map, or w were they responsible for donating money? Right, uh, I'll take the second question first, I guess. Uh, Chase did uh, support that project, and so some of our projects are grants or gift supported, um, about 30%, I believe. Um, so they were involved with, uh, you know, that's what gave us the funds, for example, to commission all of those write-ups and a lot of the photography, some of the content in there. Um, that is now mixing in with content that is from the libraries here and from students. Um, the first question is a huge one, and we certainly won't uh, settle it before lunch. Uh, assessment is always very difficult. Um, in our grant projects, we build it in, um, and we try to build it in anyway. Um, we have an iterative design research process, so we try implementations of projects in classrooms. We sit back, we evaluate with the instructor, was that, in, was that effective, was that not effective, what went well, what didn't, and then we try it again. We never just launch a project and then drop it. Um, in some ways, Digital Bridges offers some easier points of assessment. Um, in other words, if your questions are, are my students engaging with source materials more than they used to, those kinds of things are a little bit easier to measure, as we're starting to do with South Street Journal, um, than the deeper questions about are they engaging in critical thought or intellectual discourse in a deeper way because of technology. We're always asking those questions. Just, uh, can I just add one thing? Um, the other point about some of this material is that it's really hard to get a class of 10, 15, 20 students uh, using original source material that's rare and um, fragile. So digitization and then putting it into this sort of environment really allows for access to primary material in a different way. I think you answered the question in the presentations where you mentioned something with the New York Public Library and with Hunter College, but you are open to collaborations with other institutions in New York around specific projects that would be available beyond Columbia Community. Oh, of course. Uh, another one is the New York Neighborhoods Project that some of you saw earlier this morning, the mapping project. We've been talking to the city about ways to uh, bring in some of the data that the city collects on neighborhoods, uh, mixing it with some of the reports that the students are generating about the neighborhoods and offering it to the public. These are complicated issues. I mean, there are issues about Columbia University representing the city. Um, and there are issues about bringing in the data into significant learning activities for them while they're here at the Columbia. But there's enormous interest in interacting with uh, partner institutions, um, not only in New York, but um, you know, throughout. I just wanted to ask, in terms of uh, maintaining the, site, the number of sites that you are working collaboratively with faculty on, do you handle ongoing maintenance, or is that shifted then to the department if it's not something that requires uh, heavy technical expertise? That's a very good question. I mean, and it has a lot to do with the uh, repository initiatives that uh, Patricia was talking about, Fedora implementation, and how the tools that we build sit on top of a, a, a real strategy for archiving and managing this digital media over time. Uh, anyone who works with digital media knows that it is incredibly fragile and incredibly shifting. Um, it's nothing like microfilm, which kind of stays in place for 50 years. Uh, I assume that's what you were referring to, um, the sort of the, the need to sort of maintain the integrity of these resources after they're created. 
frankly, the center does not have a lot of expertise in that area, and that's where we really depend on the library to co understand what we're doing and to um, help us um, keep it. I think, I think uh, time is up, and I think that we get lunch now, so let's do that. Thank you very much. Uh, please.